Thank you. Can you hear that, or should I just pick this up and pretend I'm Madonna? Like, I'm totally cool with this, right? All right, so this is a repo I put together with everything except for this slide presentation, which I will push up there later today. If you want to quick take a picture of it and download it now or come back to it later, that's cool. This is uh, my pre presentation on linear programming using Python 2.7 and Pulp. And so that 2.7 should be a little bit of horror because you know it's going away soon. It's going to be unsupported. I would love it if you would send the curators of this package a little, hey, Python 3 is OK message. Because I think, I think it's time for us to start telling people they need to move forward with Python 3. I um, actually don't didn't even have Python 2.7 on any of my current laptops and in, installed it in environments specifically for this. But um, it, is worth, it is worth it. This is cool, and it won't be hard. I want you to not be afraid. I am not a mathy person. My undergraduate degree, I have two. My first one is uh, in fine arts, which was filled with algebra. It was crazy. And, and my second one was in biology. And I took a little math, but I didn't take excessive math. So this is really aimed at a pragmatic look at linear programming and approaching it from a Pythonic perspective. Great, I am a data scientist with Service Channel. It's a software as a service uh, facilities management product and an educator. I was a high school teacher and prior to Service Channel, I taught full-time boot camps at General Assembly in Boston. And I'm currently finishing up a part-time Python programming course uh, teaching just the basics of Python and a little bit of Flask there as well. All right. So the objectives for today, just to understand how to build an appropriate computing environment. We're going to breeze over that, but there's a long readme in the repo that tells you how to build a virtual environment, how to pull in the appropriate Conda packages and, and install pulp so that you could get running in the right direction without wrecking everything that's already happening in your system. And so I think that virtual environment is really important. Uh, we're going to define what linear programming is and talk about some applications for it and uses for it. And then we're actually going to go hop on over and do some live, live coding. And by live, I mean I already wrote a notebook. You don't want to see me type. Um, and we're going to work through a model that I introduce um, analytically and just conceptually on slides, and then we'll hop over and do the simple program for it after we test our environment to make sure it's working. And then um, I'll move forward to a little more complex version. And if you need to, like I know they say don't ask questions. I don't follow rules. If you get lost, let me know. And so what is linear programming, right? It's just an optimization modeling method. It does really basically two things. It minimizes something or it maximizes something. Oh, I did that in the wrong direction. It minimizes or it maximizes, right? And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a ton. It is a ton, right? It does a lot of the things in business that you would guess at or gut, you can actually know using linear programming. And so that makes it a really powerful tool, right? Its greatest asset is that it is deterministic, right? And so now you're like, oh, big words. Just means it has a fixed real answer and it's consistent. If I give it the same numbers every single time, I'm going to get the same output provided I wrote everything correctly, right? You may not experience that when you're debugging, but when you actually run a completed application, you get a fixed output. A lot of data science is stochastic, right? Things are estimated or, or, or calculated using some probabilistic method. So that's a really highly informed estimate of something. But if there's a real answer to it, why use a complicated, time-consuming, uh, you know, stochastic method to get to an approximate of something you can actually know? And to me, that's the real value of linear programming. And I think some of these deterministic methods are breezed over in decision sciences when they're really useful. Right? Very, very commonly used in business and optimization and logistics, frequently be done in Excel or some other business application, and the programming team won't even know that there's a rock star in the business team. And so there are 
three major steps to the process. The formulation of the, prod uh, the problem, which is establishing criteria. What are we trying to optimize? Are we maximizing or minimizing something? What is that target? Right? You have to set a good target to get good results. And then what are my constraints? In everything you do, there's constraints, right? Your wife says, go to the supermarket and get something. She doesn't mean get everything, right? Yeah. Or if she does and she hasn't been cleared, like, then you got some leverage. But, <laughs> but in general, like everything you do, there are constraints, there are limits. And so establishing those and recognizing all of them is the key to getting a good uh, linear program output. Right? And then you develop uh, a solution. You should do sensitivity analysis, which we won't do here because it's kind of outside of the scope, and that's more of an analytical thing. There's code for it. It's contained within pulp, but it's sort of more of a, a tangent. And then you interpret the results. And we will talk a little about that here today, but those are really the decision science parts of it. I really want you to see the, the usefulness of pulp and Python as a tool, right? Really important to know, this only works when there are alternate possible paths. <laughs> if all of the variables you pull into this equation can be constructed such that there's only one possible outcome, you don't need linear programming. If there's a single path to success, it's not a linear programming option. This is about taking a series of criteria and constraints and throwing them to scary matrix math and getting a delightful, compact, definitive answer. And there are four assumptions of linear programming. One is certainty, that during the process, none of your variables will change. So if you're trying to estimate uh, how, how the ratio of pork to pork fat to spices in a sausage, you don't lose 300 pounds of pork halfway through your estimate, right? You start and finish with the same amounts. It's not a changing uh, system. We have the idea of proportionality, right? That the input is proportional to the output and that those are persisted throughout the entire chain, right? It's not gonna change midstream. Additivity, that the sum of the holes are equal to the sum of the parts. If I'm trying to uh, predict the appropriate price point for a bushel of apples and a bushel of pears and the profit, on a bushel of apples is a dollar and the uh, profit on a bushel of pears is a dollar ten, then my profit better be five dollars and thirty cents if I have two bushels of apples and three bushels of pears. If it's not, then I don't have that additivity. And so the, you can't create constraints that will adjust for that. And the other one is uh, divisibility, and we're gonna violate that right away. But <laughs> we're not going to violate it because we're awful people. We're going to violate that because, strictly speaking, uh, linear programming is a continuous value entity. But there's also an integer programming, right? There are things we want to want to know discreetly. Uh, the state of New Hampshire. I used to be a data scientist uh, there, doing public health stuff. They didn't want to know what proportion of fractional people got sick. They wanted to know what proportional of whole people got sick. They were very, very cold-hearted about that. If you're only half a man, <laughs> the flu doesn't matter. Right? And so there are reasons why discrete is, is significant. All right. And so the major components of a good linear program, which is anyone that works and does what you need to, is an objective function and a, seri and a series of constraint functions. It could be one, it could be many. Right. And the objective function is the one that defines your goal, your target, what you're either trying to minimize or maximize. I clearly have an issue with up and down. Uh, yeah, so what you're trying to maximize or minimize. And the constraint functions, they set up the boundaries within which that objective function has to function. Right, and so you give it criteria and cons constraints that limit how far it can go in any given direction for any of the variables, right? And it's a beautiful thing. If you remember this from high school algebra, probably algebra one, maybe. I took that a couple times. It was good. 
uh, y equals mx plus b. That is the base concept behind this, but we get rid of the b, the constant b, right? We don't really need to calculate for constants. You could just add them later and they're not really a part of this, but you could have multiple x variables, x sub one, x sub two, x sub three. It's important these are not polynomials, right? They're not polynomials. Right. It's important. Um, so the outcome decision variable, right, is the, these are all of the variables that you will use in your equation for, sol for optimizing. They have a tendency to form equations that look something like this, right? And so this would be one variable, and one of those plus two of something else would equal 10. And that seems simple enough. You could probably solve for that with one other equation if you had, a value, if you had some other uh, proportions of x1 and x2. But when you get to many, many, many of them, and some of them are equal to or greater than or less than, then it starts to get complex, right? And so my personal feeling is you can write equations with these x values. I write them with meaningful Python labels because it's the Python way. And, and because we write code for computers to execute and people to read. That's really important, I heard that this morning. I say it to my students all the time, if I can't read what's on, that, what's on that page, you haven't succeeded because at some point it's gonna change and you need somebody to be able to deal with it. And so for debugging, this is super huge even though this is a mathematical pro uh, process. Oh, and another beautiful thing, I'll talk about this a little more on another slide. Just like linear regressions, Linear programming is unitless. And it doesn't mean units don't matter. It means if you've properly structured it, it doesn't matter what the units are. As long as you obey all the rules that you set up front when you define your decision variables and your constraints, they will wash themselves out in the end, which is glorious because it means not a lot of converting things back and forth. Remember physics where you spent all of your time trying to put everything in the right units and that feather past that brick? Oh, did somebody throw up? <laughs> some, some, something, some information about constraints here, right? We cannot just choose any values we want to solve our problems. If we could, we wouldn't need linear programming. So these constraints have to be pragmatic and related to your uh, target optimization. Each constraint will be structured as a linear equation. You can have as many as are needed. You can, uh, they should be independent of each other, but that does not mean that one of them can't reference another bound of a prior one. Like this could be greater than or equal to for one constraint and less than for another, and that's totally fine, right? You'll see that in the second scary problem. Um, and also, they do not need to be expressed positively. Constraints can be negative. Most of the applications that people are using them on are real business problems, and let's face it, nobody wants to make a negative income. Well, a lot of people want to declare a negative income. That's not the same thing, right? And so you can use negative numbers. I'm using positive real examples because I feel like um, when you can see something with your mind that exists in your real world, you hold it better. And so I'm, I'm living on the positive here, and we're gonna, go over a real, a real project soon. And so unit independence, this is a great thing. You can mix and match, right? You could do quarts and pints and pounds and dollars. So long as that one variable is consistent throughout all of the equations, if you're measuring flour, the amount of flour in your pancake recipe needs to be in pounds throughout every single one. That variable when it's presented when flour will always be in pounds. If, you, if you're if you consistent with that, milk can be in cups, and spices can be in teaspoons, and eggs can be in medium or large, whatever, depending on your protein needs, right? Um, you must be consistent in that way. 
Um, but other than that, anything goes. And that's a beautiful thing because it allows you to uh, formulate the linear programs in the world you live in, right? In business, you have all kinds of different things, labor hours and, and, and it, exchange rates in different countries, all kinds of stuff, right? It allows you to live in the real business realm that you live in. And even, you know, a, a lot of us are super geeky and we live in the dungeons of our buildings and do things that, you know, regular people don't do. We're usually trying to accomplish some sort of a business goal, right? We do work for the betterment of the business because I hope you guys all get paid really well for what you do. And that's about profit, right? Isn't it? No? No? All right. All right. The objective functions and constraint equations. Right? The, objection the objective function represents a, a, a proxy value for the, uh, every single possible permutation of an outcome. And so in our first example, you're just going to see two. There'll be cupcakes and cream puffs. Who doesn't love pastry, right? So there are just two. But if I had set it up so that there were three flavors of cupcakes and two kinds of cream puffs, there are permutations also. And the second pro problem, we'll get to the heart of that. And so you represent in your objective function all the possible permutations of those variables. And then the constraints define the conditions under which the linear program must act in order to fulfill that, right? And as I said before, you can have multiple constraints, um, and, and they can be conditioned upon other constraints, the higher or the lower. You guys ready to work through an example? Yeah. Woo! Oh. <laughs> they needed it. You heard them. They clearly needed that. I'm a jerk, it's okay, I know it, but I didn't swear, so the kids, you're all good, you're good. Hey, so we are hired by a bakery charged with the tax of op optimizing profits. So right there, optimizing profits, hold that, uh, for their small cakes division, because <laughs> they have a big cakes division, and it's scary, people jump out of those ones. Hey, and so you are given some constraints. You have all the materials you want, all the flour, the butter, all that stuff, but you got 800 baker hours and 350 froster hours. And that's all you have to make the most profit you possibly can. And of course, we're assuming here that the more you make, the more you sell. Clearly in a real world situation, there are finite limits based on shelf space and, and demand. Unless your cupcakes and cream puffs are so good that, that you can't, possibly keep up, then we should probably do an another kind of optimization to get you the system that you need to keep up. Um, and so we're trying to optimize revenue. Cupcakes sell for $3.50, cream puffs sell for $4. So I'm going to make you do some computations because that says nothing about profit, right? They could each cost $9 to make, you don't know. I'm a very sloppy cook. And so where do we start? Is this a minimization or a maximization problem? Anyone? Yeah, woo! All right, you guys got it right already. I can go home. No. So what are our decision variables? Could you mumble louder? Number of cupcakes and the number of cream puffs. And they will be represented here by cupcake and cream puff because I use real words, right? And so there are other things that are going to come into play here, but those are the actual decision variables. Those are the, the um, things that we can change, right? The number that we can make to change to affect that change in profit based on the constraints that I've already given you that you can have as much material as you want and sell an unlimited amount of cupcakes or cream puffs. And so the first thing we need to do is figure out, uh, this is our ingredient cost, and this is our sales price. And let's assume that, ing that we don't pay our workers at all. They just, they're free, right? It's all profit. Woo! Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an internship. You can work at home 87 hours a week for free with no guidance and mentorship. Thank you. 
Yeah. Woo! Yay! The American dream. And so, <laughs> and so if we were to create an equation, we would say if this is our profit for cupcake, and that's for cream puffs, 285 times cupcake plus 315 times cream puff equals some glorious amount of money, right? That allows you to retire in six months and move to Belize. I've heard that's the new Spain. I'm going, totally. All right. <laughs> and so these are all the pieces and parts that you have. And we use the financial cost to establish profit. But we have baking labor costs, right? It doesn't take the same amount of time to cook a cupcake as it does to cook um, a cream puff. And it doesn't take the same amount of time to frost them either because when you're just throwing something in the middle of a cream puff, nobody cares what it looks like. But when you're buying cupcakes, if they give you the one that's lopsided with no sprinkles, you're mad, right? And so there's some decorating time that's involved in that. And here are the total labor allotments. So we're gonna create this function within pulp using all of those other things, right? Such that those two sets of constraints will show us what the maximum profit is, right? So the criteria is that we have cupcake, some amount of time cupcake plus some amount of time cream puff again, plotted against a limit the limit that we have for that total task, and the combination of these two constraints will come together to give us uh, an optimal outcome. Well, there's this very cool thing that I'm sure I learned in high school. I'm very sure of it. But it never really sunk in until I started working um, in, in data science is that zeros are your friend, right? So if we substitute zero in for the cost of cupcakes and divide it out, we can get an x-intercept for the cupcakes with the cost of, or with the um, time cost of cream puffs. And if we substitute a zero in for cream puffs, we can get the same thing. And so from that, I get these two lines. And these two lines have points that minimize and maximize your profits, right? And so this was clearly the zero, zero. That's probably not the profit we're looking for. Right. And it's not, a, it's not a crossing point, but it is an option, right? And here, if we just look at this constraint line, we would be making all cream puffs and no cupcakes. And if we look here, we'd be doing all cupcakes and no cream puffs. But if you look at that intersection, right, this is a manual way of saying somewhere in that neighborhood, there's an optimal combination of the two that maximizes my profit, right? That's a pretty hard, I mean, you could guess and you could get pretty close, but why not just have available the actual number? And so we're gonna go right now and hop over to Jupyter Notebook and start working through the equation that will actually tell you the exact number of cupcakes and cream puffs. So let's see, the first thing we're gonna do before we go over there is because I did tell you you had to create, we're not creating this now, I've already created it, but you do wanna create an isolated environment. Make sure the environment's active because if it's not active, then you won't have pulp. And if you install pulp before you activate it, then it'll be out there making your Python 3 environment angry and not helping you in here. You've all done that, right? Made your ang environment angry? So I am going to pull up right now a test script, which I've included in, your, uh, in the repository for you. If we come right here and just type, oh, not clear. All right, I'm just gonna do it the hard way. Python. Oh, yes, but then you'd be able to see what I'm doing and you could judge me. <laughs> yes. Oh, where'd it go? And it's suddenly gone. I might, oh, there it is. 
There it is. So I'm just going to run Python test.py, and hopefully I'm still in the folder. I thought I was, and everything's still running the way it is. So you notice in the far left it says pulp-env. So that's my virtual environment running 2.7 with pulp installed. So I'm going to hit go. Ooh. How did that happen? Thank you. Sorry, I need two hands. Oh, there it is. No, it's not. Let's just make sure everything's in here. Yep. There we go. And so, uh, the makers of Pulp have realized, I'm gonna keep doing this because I a glutton. Um, they've realized that it's not always a trivial task to make sure you're working in the right environment, have anything going. They built in a test function, and when you hit go, this is just import Pulp, run this test function, and it goes through, and it tests all of these different methods that are in there and shows you what solvers you have available to you. We're going to use the base solver. You can go out and import and install these other solvers. And you may have seen these names before, if, particularly if you've worked in business environments. They're available to you. Uh, we won't need them. But it's just really important for me to test that before I go working in there. And I included that so you guys, once you finish your environment, wouldn't get in and start building a program and think the program wasn't working when the environment itself isn't working. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I may, may have done that hundreds of times. All right, and so here is our notebook. Much ado, I'll make this bigger too because I hear that woman in the back. Could you make it larger? I can, I've got it. So from pulp, import all. That allows me to not say pulp dot whatever, pulp dot whatever, pulp dot whatever. And I imported matplotlib so that I could make those lovely charts that I showed you before, and I'm gonna make another one. This also is a test equation uh, that comes right in the documentation from pulp. And the reason I included it here is because I would recommend you also run this before you run anything so that, and type it by hand, so that you get the feel for setting up that X and that Y constraint, the structure, the grammar, and understanding what's happening, and then run it, because they give you an, out, an output, and that output's correct, right? So you can compare yours against theirs and understand what's going on. And I'm gonna hit go on these two cells and run it, and so we're gonna get the value of X as two and Y as zero, and I know that to be correct. I should have put the link. Did I put it? I did. What was I thinking? And so that is that equation right there. And you get the right results. So it's just a good little test when you first set up your environment. And now we're going to move on to the bakery profits one. And I'm going to explain what I do as I do it. I've moved over all the criteria and constraints here so that we wouldn't have to bounce back and forth. The first thing we're going to just do is define a model, right? So we're going to instantiate a model using pulp. Oh yeah, I didn't eliminate the pulp thing. I still have to use it. Whatever. So I define the problem, LP problem. I instantiate a problem and I give it a sort of description. I am maximizing, it's a profit maximization problem. I'm maximizing profits. And then I call LP maximize. There's also LP minimize. There's binary versions. Um, and you can do both uh, integer and, and continuous based optimizations within this. This one is actually integer based because I, who's gonna buy half a cupcake? That's kind of scary. Like where's that other half been, right? And so, now we're going to define, and this is how you sort of define your outcome. Right? We're going to define the individual variables that we're using to optimize. And in this case, it's a cupcake. And we define that as a linear programming variable. We give it a name, a reference name. If you don't give it a reference name, it's not going to be happy. We give it a lower boundary, right? You can't make negative 10 cupcakes. That's called eating, right? <laughs> And if we wanted to, we could create a maximum, right? I don't think that's necessary. Who, who wants to limit the cupcakes in their life, right? And then K 
category of classification for each of these variables. And these are both defined as integers because, again, nobody wants half a cream puff, unless you've already eaten the other half and you saved it for later. Right. And so the objective function is just we take the model and we use that good old weird reflexive kind of plus equals thing that you have in Python to add back into it uh, this equation where 2.85, which is the profit for a cupcake, plus 3.15 times cream puff, which is the profit for a cream puff. And remember, we're trying to take that profit from each one of those and build some number of cream puffs and cupcakes that are maximally advantageous, and we're going to predict profit. Right? This isn't too hard. Right? This is linear math. You're doing it. You guys are doing matrix math right now. God, you're good. And so then we come up with some constraint functions, which look basically the same, except you do something you never really see, which is have like a plus equals and like another equals elsewhere. And you're like, what's going on? It's weird. The first time you do it, you're like, it's going to break. Yeah. It's not going to break, I promise. I can't really promise that. <laughs> I make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and so we add to the model the fact that baking time for a cupcake is uh, five, ten, uh, five hundredths of an hour, right? And for cream puff is eight hundredths of an hour. And see, this is what I said. You can use any units you want. I didn't want to figure minutes and then convert to hours, so I just did fractional hours. And then frosting time, 0.4 for the pretty cupcakes and 0.3 for the ugly puffs. And the total, and you set them less than or equal to the time constraints. And that's really important. You can use every last minute, but you can't lose, use more. And you don't need to use all, right? So if the cream puffs were the, the big profit winner and what we should make most out of, we might not need as much frosting time. Or if the cupcakes are winner, we might not need all of the baking time, but we might need all of the frosting time. And so you give yourself up to and including something so that it cannot use all of that time. Your ultimate profit may not be by using everything that you have. And then we hit model solve. And then we look for a status. And this is really, really, really important, right? It's like being married. You check in once in a while to be sure you're on the same page, right? Yeah. I made that up, I wouldn't know, but. Because <laughs> I'm not a good person. I'm gonna run all above. I'm not a good person. All right, optimal, woo! Optimal means it was able to optimize, touchdown! Of course, I could have still made a logic error that makes this garbage. And if I did, you can feel free to send me an email. But this means that the code worked and that there were sufficient amounts of time available uh, that it could come to an optimal conclusion and with two two variables and two constraints it's not really that hard to get there the problem that I'm instead of stealing made up for the next one pushed my buttons a little bit harder to get to optimal there are other options right and so we can retrieve the optimal production values for profit and we just type in cupcake dot var value and cream puff dot var value Oh, and these are the other options. Not solved. That just means you didn't run it and you're asking for something you didn't give it. And that's a, mu that's a very, very nice message, right? Not solved as opposed to idiot. <laughs> optimal means we were able to come to a, an optimal result. Infeasible. So that means that your constraints are set up such that you can't get to an optimal output. And this is what I did 387,452,906 times. That might not be a real number. Um, yesterday and the day before because I decided after I got here to rework all my code because who couldn't make something better in the ninth hour and uh, I broke it and then I couldn't figure out how I broke it because I was so tired I couldn't see anymore and so I saw lots of infeasibility and then unbounded that just means that you have something without really a fixed limit right and so there is no optimum you just keep going run with it and undefined either means there isn't one or, or they couldn't find one. And there are situations where 
you know, you can't necessarily get to something in a linear fashion. Not everything's linear. My thinking clearly is, but everything else is not. It's okay to laugh. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a very needy person without that feedback. Let me just start crying. So let's look at the cupcakes. 10 minutes. Oh, no pressure. 2,352 cupcakes. That's how many cupcakes we'll make. How many cream puffs do you think we're going to make? How many? Five. Oh, God. In just 800 baking hours. Whew. If you can, I want that TARDIS. That is cool. 8,530 cream puffs. Can you tell I'm French? I favored the cream puffs. They've got butter and all kinds of other good stuff in there. You're not supposed to have your doctors like never eat one again. I'm having 10. It's, you can't just eat one. Right. Because the only way to, yeah, to get to tame that sugar high is to get higher. Right. Right. So, yeah, yeah. I'm a unbounded. unbounded. Exactly. <laughs> Cannot be handled with this equation, right? And so let's get the total value, find out what our optimized profit is for this. Right here. 33,000 dollars worth of cupcakes and cream puffs. I am in the wrong business. That's one month, people. One month. Of course, I made all of the numbers up, and there was no rent and there was no labor costs. Well, in, to Donald Trump, they are. Sorry, bad. My bad. I'm, I don't really feel bad. I'm sorry. I don't feel bad. He would say mean things about me if he was here because they're all true. But, right. And so I wrote a pretty print statement. Woo! Because you guys got to learn how to do that and use the format with the squiggly brackets. And based on this, that, and the other thing, that's how much money we make. Did that seem really hard? Did that seem mathy? No, it was good, right? So can you think of ways you can make your life better? Could you mumble louder? What? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I bet almost every one of you can think of some component of where you work or what you do where this could be used in some way to improve something. And sometimes really small changes can have order of magnitude improvements, right? And there's this leaning in data science to be constantly focused on probabilistic things and cool, sexy algorithms and things that are big and menacing and take tons of computational power that if left on will cost your company $42 million in AWS. It, like, who hasn't done that twice? <laughs> but this is simple and it's finite and it's fixed and it's something you can validate, and it's low-hanging fruit. If you can walk through your organization, whether it's your development team and figure out how to better allocate time and use, whether it's uh, logistical stuff or supply stuff or when to order or how to package, if three different ways of packaging all have the exact same breakage rate, you can calculate which one optimizes your profit, reduces your shipping costs. That's that's useful, right? When it's between you and Joe on the layoff line and you just saved your company $287,000 a month. Whew, see you, Joe. That's, hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> it's all about, and you don't even have to backstab anyone, right? You just, just got to like, eh, hey. It's, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll be good. And so here is the, uh, the graphs that I made earlier. I have remade them, and this orange dot is actually reflective of that optimal rate. And you can kind of see it somewhere in the neighborhood of five bajillion cupcakes. Are you guys ready for the really, really, I'm going to skip over the, scary, the really scary problem. This problem is a little scarier. And it's only scarier um, because it has a lot of wiggle room in it. But there are ways you can use this that just aren't like 10 of these and 12 of these or 42 and 55 of this. And so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a company that manufactures um, generic granola, premium generic granola for a retailer, right? 
and they use oats, cashew, honey, and raisins. They have two grades, premium and standard. And they have to deliver, and I'm doing this kind of oddly, but I will explain that in a minute. They have to deliver a certain amount. Oh, and for me, if I were writing these equations manually, which we won't be doing, Python will be doing all of it, I would say ingredient underscore P as like oats P, oats S, um, so that I would know what they were if I was doing this manually. We're gonna allow uh, dictionaries and all kinds of cool stuff to do their work within the pulp package to set up those internal variables. But it's really important in the beginning, I think, that you sit down and try and write out equations for full equations for the criteria and the constraints that you use so that you have a sense of what's going on. And if I showed you my notebook, if you could read it, because I'm a terrible writer, as we already discussed, um, those are in there. And they're really important because you could miss things, right? And so we're going to build the problem the same way, except this one's a minimizing problem, right? I'm trying to minimize the cost. So instead of saying, here's my fixed recipe, it takes a quart of this, a pint of that, three pounds of that, we're saying, we've done tests. And between this amount and this amount of cashews is good, and this amount and this amount of raisins is good, and this amount and this amount of honey is good, and all the rest is oats, right? And so in a standard value package, people think this is good. For premium, they expect this, but no more than this, right? And so that complicates things. We have bounding values on both sides, and we're asking how much to produce, uh, how much to include as the proper ratio of, of ingredients to fulfill an exact number of each. And so for this, we're minimizing the ingredient ratios using LP minimize, and we're creating lists of uh, decision variables for the objective function. So with the granola blend, we have premium and standard, we have those two. And we have four ingredients. And so we will ask pulp to do the heavy lifting using some list comprehension-y things. We're gonna make 275 pouches of premium and 450 pouches of standard grade granola. And so our materials are coming to us in pounds. We have 380 pounds of oats available, 75 pounds of cashews, 60 pounds of honey, and 61 pounds of raisins. And this is our cost. And so we're trying to minimize our cost while meeting those criteria and making that many pouches. And those pouches are 12 ounces each, which is 0.75 pounds, right? I'm not going to convert to ounces. I'm just going to use a fractional pound. And we create in pulp, weight in pounds. We do this cool uh, comprehension with blends and ingredients for blend and granola blends. So it goes through each blend premium and standard and works through the blends and the ingredients to create these combinations. The lower bound being zero because we can't make granola without food in it. And then this category is continuous, because in this case, it doesn't matter. We're not looking for holes. We're looking to get to the right amount, right? And then that print what components was there for me, but I'll show you later. The model becomes more complex here. And so we have to create LP sums, which are uh, linear programming sums of the component weights of each blend, each blend for each material. And we use as the coefficient the cost per material. And these are the criteria of what makes up premium and standard. So the constraints start to get a little bit uglier. We create, a, um, uh, this is how we send it through to get the appropriate constraint weights for the number of each type. Premium, we need 275 at 3 quarters of a pound, and we need 450 at 3 quarters of a pound for standard. And then we create constraints where standard raisins is greater than or equal to 
0.15, cashews is greater than or equal to 0.2, and honey is greater than or equal to 0.10. And you don't really need to give it an upper bound because it's going to try and minimize your cost no matter what. So it's going to get to a value that it's going to hold you in. It's not going to be like 15 pounds of honey. This is gross. Well, somebody might like that. but. And then the same thing for premium. We put in the numbers with slightly higher amounts of the raisins and cashews and the honey. And then we pass them back into the LP sums going for each blend, for each thing, based on the total amount that we have, a set of criteria for the total available amounts that we have. And this is the part I kept messing up. Like I kept putting decimals in there. Like, yeah, yeah we can do it with 30 ounces of, of oats. Okay. And then solve the same way we did before. And then print out for each ingredient, for each component weight. And I will run all above here because we're running out of time. I have zero minutes left. Shh, I'm stealing from someone. Um, I'm going to run all above. And, oh, we got an optimal result. That's good because sometimes we don't or I don't. And we'll hit go, and it prints out. And, and those of you working in Python 3.5 or 6 and newer who now have dictionaries that are order preserved will see how there's like three standards, a premium, a standard. It just resorts itself because it's a dictionary and puts it wherever it wants. But here you have the amount of each product you need to make one giant batch, which can, which can then be sorted into 275 premium and 450 standard, um, yeah, and uh, standard pouches. And then I just verified that I had the right amounts of things here. Whew, thank God that worked out. And then the total cost, right? And the total cost is $1,346. If you have questions, I'll take them in the hallway because he's looking at me funny.